It's a long queue that could have an impact on our daily lives. For the past few weeks, hundreds of container ships have been clogging up in front of one of the essential links in international trade, the Panama Canal. A gigantic 80-kilometer long shipping lane has been taken over by cargo ships. They are all waiting to cross this 100-year-old passage linking the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans. Some 14,000 ships use it every year, representing 6% of world trade, a key link in the supply chain to stores all over the world. But a problem that's here to stay. Technical failure, lack of space, climate issues. Why is this marvel of engineering now under threat? That's what we're going to find out in this new episode of Infinity History. Ferdinand de Lesseps failure to build the Panama Canal. It may seem surprising, but to begin our dive into the heart of the Panama Canal, we're going to France. Our only journey is back in time to the end of the 19th century, to meet the man nicknamed the Great Frenchman. In 1880, diplomat Ferdinand de Lesseps founded the Universal Company of the Panama Interoceanic Canal. He took up a crazy project to link the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans. To do this, he wanted to pierce an 80-kilometer strip of land south of Panama, between the Caribbean Sea and Panama Bay. The man is confident and has a lot to live up to. He was the main promoter of the success of the Suez Canal, which had been opened 10 years earlier. On the strength of his success, he wanted to double the stakes. He bought back the concession to the land that was still under the authority of the United States of Colombia in 1882. The first shovels were turned on the land. But the problems soon followed. The great Frenchman wanted to do the same as he had done for Suez. But the construction site was very different. Jungle had to be overcome, and a hill almost hundred meters above ocean level had to be cut through. Above all, climatic conditions became unbearable for the workers. With tropical storms, mudsleeties, and soon disease, malaria and yellow fever ravaged the teams on site, and the project was on the verge of bankruptcy. The plans were reorganized to build a canal with a lock, as requested by many of the project's parties, including Gustave Eiffel, the future designer of Paris's most iconic tower. But it was too late for such a change, especially as the affair was coupled with one of the biggest financial scandals of the century in France. Tens of thousands of savers financed the project through a large-scale public subscription. In reality, this money was used more to bribe the public authorities than to finance a canal that seemed increasingly unfeasible. Ferdinand de Lesseps company went into receivership in 1889. It was an adventure that cost tens of thousands of small investors their money, and far worse, the lives of over 20,000 workers. Despite the fiasco, the Panama Canal continues to arouse envy. The route was already the envy of the Spanish conquistadors in the 16th century, American takeover of the project, and for good reason. This route of less than 100 kilometers would avoid having to bypass the whole of South America and round the dangerous Cape Horn. This would save precious time and money, the history of a country intertwined with that of the future canal. In 1903, supported by the United States, Panama declared its independence. A few days later, this support earned the United States a perpetual concession for the canal, as well as a 16 kilometer wide strip of land crossing the country from one end to the other. Work resumed in 1904. The engineers chose the idea of a lock canal. The arrival of vaccines prevented the spread of certain tropical diseases. This titanic project lasted 10 years, mobilizing a complex system of steam engines and visionary railway engineering. This was notably the case for clearing the millions of tons of rock removed when the canals were drilled. Nearly 40,000 workers were employed at the peak of construction. The project cost the United States nearly $375 million, by far the calibration of locks and the birth of Panamax's the most expensive project in the country at the time, 79.6 kilometers long. Two artificial lakes and three huge 33-meter wide locks made it possible to cross the American continent, a bloody feat. Another 5,000 workers died during the construction of this breakthrough. The canal was officially opened on April 15, 1914, just as Europe was plunged into the First World War. The Americans had total control over this key axis of maritime communication, the return of the canal to Panama. They decided on the size of the locks. 
They had 320 meters long and 33 meters wide. These dimensions were to set the standards for the new giants of the seas, the Panamax 32 meters wide and 294 meters long. It wasn't until the The Canal, Panama's economic lung 1970s that a process was set in motion to hand back the canal and the American enclave to Panama. In 1999, Panama became the owner of the canal that bears its name. Today, the canal is one of the country's most important financial resources. The canal accounts for 10% of the country's revenue. Thanks to all the tax revenues it generates and all the related activities passing through this unique corridor is obviously not free. According to figures released by the Canal Control Authority, passage fees range from $10,000 for the smallest vessels to $300,000 for the Neo Panamax container ships. These monsters are 3.65 meters long. How the Panama Canal works and can carry almost 12,000 containers. Prices can even soar during peak periods during such periods. Certain available slots are auctioned off by the port's administrators. Recently, a chemical tanker paid $2.4 million to be allowed to pass ahead of everyone else. It's a financial windfall whose viability is now in doubt as the canal model is on borrowed time. The road operates on a system that is still in use today. The engineers didn't clear all the land to build the canal. Instead, they leveled the road before flooding it with two artificial lakes. The main one, Lake Gatton, and a second lake drought, threatens the Canal Alajuela formerly known as Lake Madden. These lakes are irrigated by inland rivers to access this road 28 meters above sea level. A system of locks is used to raise and lower the boats. It's a masterpiece that requires the use of locomotives on the banks of the canal to move the boat from one lock to another. A system that comes at a price between 200 and 250 million liters of fresh water from the canal are lost to the ocean. Each time a boat passes through. This is not a problem when rainfall is good, but global warming is changing the rules of the game and droughts are becoming increasingly frequent. After 2016 and 2019, a new episode has hit Panama since May during what should be the rainy season. The situation has been made worse by the arrival of the El Nino weather phenomenon on weather maps. Water precipitation indicators are often stuck at zero in the region, lowering river and lake levels. The level is so low that the authorities have had to take the first measures of precaution. The tonnage of boats is reduced to prevent them from sinking to the bottom. The number of container ships using this route per day has also been reduced from 40 to 32. As a result, there are longer queues at the gates of this seaway. Expansion of the Panama Canal Unlike the Suez Canal, access is via a lock system with the help of tugs and specially trained operators to perform this perilous task. With just as much demand but less capacity, the wait is getting much longer. In early September, the newspaper Le Monde reported that boat waiting times had risen from four days in ordinary times to almost 20 days in mid-August. Back in 2006, the queues in Panama were already making headlines. The canal had become too old, too small to accommodate the new container ships. Ever larger, ever wider, ever bigger. Following a referendum vote, the country embarked on a $6 billion expansion of the canal in 2016. The new canal opened its locks, enabling 95% of the world's ships to pass through. Lake Gatun has also been transformed. Its bed has been deepened by 45 centimeters. This work was intended to allow more boats to pass through each day. Despite expectations, this colossal project has not solved the water shortage problem in the face of drought. Panama seems helpless for the time being. The first response has been to confirm restrictions on passage for the coming year. If the rains are not sufficient until November, the end of the country's rainy season, yet the stakes are vital. If the situation persists, ship owners could use other trade routes, in particular the Arctic route, as global temperatures rise and ice melt accelerates. This route is becoming increasingly practicable during the summer months, while boats can change their routes. The drying up of the canal also has repercussions for the inhabitants. The two artificial lakes are also a source of drinking water for the country's capital, Panama City, and its suburbs. Over two million people use the water supplied by the canal. That's almost half the population of the Central American state. The authorities are aware that something needs to be done from the point of view of the volume of water required by the Panama Canal. 
Another source of supply is necessary, said canal administrator proposed projects to counter the effects of global warming, Ricaorte Vasquez, in mid-September at a press conference. He unveiled an outline solution the creation of a new water reservoir to the west of the canal. This would be made up of water from the Indio River. This reservoir would feed the main artificial lake Lake Gatun via an 8-kilometer underground tunnel. This new source of supply will have to be built up first, and this is likely to take some time. Estimates suggest that it will take around three months if rainfall is abundant and almost 2.5 years if drought persists. Another potential project announced by the company is the extraction of precious liquid from Lake Bayano and its subsequent pouring into the sea passage. These new developments still need to be consolidated, approved, and financed before they can see the light of day. In its latest press release at the time of this video's release, the company managing the canal announced that the situation was improving, with boats waiting less than they did a month or two ago. Nevertheless, the level of Lake Gatun remains dramatically low, more than two meters below seasonal norms, a fact which proves that the problem remains unresolved. Well, this is the end of this video. If you liked it, don't hesitate to subscribe to the channel. Thank you for watching and see you soon on Infinity History. Goodbye.